Well, um, thank you. Uh, certainly some powerful thoughts there from uh, Rachel in that speech, and I'm glad we got to, to hear it again for those who weren't able to, to see it this morning. It is my privilege now to introduce our panelists, um, starting with Michelle Spurzel. Uh, Michelle has nearly 25 years of leadership and nonprofit experience. She currently serves as Chief Executive Officer of Harbor House of Central Florida, Orange County's own state certified domestic violence organization. And during the past four years, she's focused on improving processes for survivors, started conversations with, in the community around the pandemic, opened the new temporary housing facility on the Harbor House campus, and implemented youth programs to stem the tide of domestic violence. Michelle, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. Thank you. We are also joined by Monique Worrell. Monique Worrell is the state attorney for the Ninth Judicial Circuit Court of the state of Florida. She was elected in November of 2020 and serves as the chief prosecutor. Monique is the second African-American elected as state attorney and the first of Caribbean descent. She made Central Florida her home in 1996, and after receiving her law degree from the University of Florida in 1999, she began her career as a public defender in Orange County. She then went on to private practice, where she continues to focus on criminal justice, and later became a clinical law professor at the University of Florida College of Law, where she trained law students who aspired to practice criminal law. Uh, State Attorney Worrell, thank you so much as well. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, we are also uh, joined tonight by uh, Detective Teresa Sprague. She is an experienced homicide detective for the Orlando Police Department. Prior to transferring to homicide in 2011, Detective Sprague worked in assault and battery on highly, high lethality intimate partner violence cases for two years. She worked in the federal grant position from the Department of Justice's Office of Violence Against Women Grant retrained law enforcement on the best practices for the initial patrol response to domestic and dating violence, as well as properly investigating these cases to prevent homicides. Uh, Detective Sprague, thank you so much for joining us as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm going to begin uh, with a question for you, uh, Michelle. And that question is, what can be done to counter the act counteract rather the isolation and abandonment of victims by friends and family asking the why didn't you just leave question both in the immediate context of the abuse and on a wider scale? That's a great question and Rachel did a really great um, example of how it is not just an immediacy about the fact you can't just pack your bag and go. Uh, a lot of times people who are <laughs> wanting to be able to leave they want to be able to have a plan to be able to do it such as get a job, be able to take care of the kids and whatnot. And so part of that is uh, um, working with people and understanding that, uh, that you shouldn't blame the victim for what it is that they're going through. And that there are reasons that are happening that they might have a plan and you can work with them as far as how you can help them achieve leaving if that's what they wanna do. And so part of it is listening. I like when she was talking about the fact that, and I say this often, everybody's an advocate. So learning about domestic violence, learning the signs of domestic violence, learning how you can help somebody who's experiencing domestic violence. And the number one way you can do that is by listening. The second thing is by learning about domestic violence and knowing the local resources that are in the area. And that would be anybody can do that. It can be clergy, it can be um, a, a, someone who is your coworker or your boss, things of that nature. And so that's the important part as far as making sure that when someone is in the immediate need to leave and also that long-term, how you can best support them. And so learning the number of the local domestic violence center in your area is really important. And then also um, researching. And I would have to say, um, one, filing an injunction is important. Another tool that's along with that is um, working with someone to help create a safety plan and working with a domestic violence advocate to do that is a huge part. And when people say, why doesn't she just leave? When you're in the movement, um, another thing you want to say is, well, why are you saying it's okay for him to be responsible or her, the abuser, to do the things that they're doing? And so again, being aware of victim blaming and being aware that there's two sides to that relationship is really important when we're talking about how do we break down systems. Yeah, one other thing that really stuck with me about the um, the talk we just listened to was the idea of connecting all the pieces together and, and agencies working together. And that's sort of leads me into my next question uh, for for you, State Attorney Worrell. And, and the question is, how does the State Attorney's Office or how can the State Attorney's Office 
work with law enforcement to hold perpetrators accountable? Sure. So uh, law enforcement off the law enforcement and the state attorney's office works together hand in hand to ensure that perpetrators are held accountable by ensuring that the case is properly investigated and that all the necessary evidence is gathered and the victim is supported throughout the entire process. Because of open communication between law enforcement and prosecutors, this leads to reviewing cases from multiple perspectives and gathering of new evidence. It can also begin the long process of ensuring that the victim knows they can trust the system to help them through the difficult process of holding their abuser accountable. Talking about trust, I mean, is that a barrier that can be difficult to overcome if, if maybe there's been a, a pattern in the past of cases that haven't gone the way of victims? I, I think because of that, but just also in general, trust is going to be a factor because someone who is being abused and being victimized is going to have a barrier to trust. So I think absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, let me bring you into this conversation, Detective Sprague. And as a law enforcement agent, uh, you are protecting survivors of domestic violence during a time where social distancing and enhanced measures are being taken to keep all involved safe. So, so how is that happening? Because you know the pandemic has been challenging for everyone, but what, what does it mean for the work that you do, Detective? Well, our officers, of course, were you know taking precautions and uh, during the pandemic, masking up. But also, the domestic violence response team was getting updated training uh, from our domestic violence detective uh, Kim, who handles those cases I used to handle. Um, the domestic violence response team is responsible for going out um, and not taking over cases from law enforcement officers, but assisting them. And they were informed by our uh, domestic violence detective to expect an increase in these cases as people were spending much more time together and at home um, and trained to assist all of our law enforcement officers to recognize those signs um, and intervene um, in a way, obviously you can't really separate people. They can't necessarily, maybe they don't wanna go to shelter or they're afraid to go to their parents' house if they're if because of the pandemic. So they really had to be innovative um, and find different ways uh, to help people get out of those situations in a, in a way that traditionally we would offer, you know, go to a family member's house, go to your parents' home, mm -hmm. grandparents' home. Um, can you separate and go to a shelter? And that, that really was challenging or has so been. Can you talk us through some of the innovations that you've had to develop uh, through the last couple of years? Well, um, I can tell you that the, um, officers had to think of, re reach out to resources and use alternative message or alternative methods like hotels uh, was, you know, partnerships I'm sure that we created and used um, resources that Michelle Spurzel at Harbor House, um, but they had to do the same thing as far as finding different ways to get people to safety um, and not stay in those situations because people really couldn't get away from each other even to calm down or even to um, you know, let things cool off for a while. So um, they had to figure out different alternative ways to get people either you know, to separate uh, temporarily or obviously um, even in going to jail. The jail was having COVID outbreaks. Um, so when a perpetrator does bond out, there's another level, a layer uh, because they weren't really told you know, if they had a no contact order, they couldn't go home. So it was, it, I'm sure it was the last two years and probably a very, very challenging for, you know, everyone, um, even at the state attorney level, you know, not having court like we were. So, um, but, you know, I, I want to comment uh, because the state attorney is here. When I was doing domestic violence in 2009, 10, and 11, um, they had uh, domestic violence uh, misdemeanors in a specialized unit and then felonies uh, we're going to the felony division and they have since combined uh, domestic violence felonies and misdemeanors under one unit under Michelle Latham's leadership. And um, I worked closely with her for a number of years. And that was that was game changing, uh, having having the felony domestic violence cases and the misdemeanor cases under one roof. So they're a great partner with us and, and with Harbor House. State Attorney, I'm interested to hear your perspective on that. Like, talk to us about how, how kind of um that coordination looks from your level? 
Well, I mean, it's, I think the coordination between all of the partners is extremely important. You know, I think that particularly when you're dealing with people in, in these types of situations, you have to provide them with reassurance in whichever way you can. You know, I think something that Michelle said was so important is that instead of talking about, you know, why victims don't want to leave, we have to look more at why is this person being a victim of abuse? And I think that that coordination is important because we're lawyers and, you know, um, Teresa talks about Michelle Latham. She is, you know, really a gem and, and has a very unique um, knowledge and insight into domestic violence, but typically that's not something that you find. And it's important that uh, the state attorney's office is able to rely on community partners so that we can be educated on what are the things that we need to be doing? How do we need to be dealing with uh, the people who are abused? What happens when they don't wanna go forward with their case? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I've been an attorney for 21 or two years at this point. I lost track after 20 because it was just easier to say 20. And, you know, there was a time where uh, the prosecutors would hold victims in contempt if they didn't want to testify. And that was something that I said under my administration. We wouldn't do that because that is re victimizing a victim all over again. But it took a level of education. Um, in the system to understand that that's not how we do it. That's not how we get safety um, for our victims. That's not how we get justice for our victims. And I think that it's coordination like this that allow those type of results to take place. And that's another takeaway, I guess, right from the, the keynote address is, you know, how, how can you prosecute uh, an abuser if the victim is too scared or unable to assist with the case? very, very uh, carefully, I guess, is the, is the answer to that. You know, we make every effort to follow an evidence-based prosecution model in these types of cases. And that means wherever we can proceed, we will proceed. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to victim shame. We're not going to harass. We're not going to re-victimize individuals by trying to force them to do something that they're not uh, willing to do or ready to do but we're gonna provide them with their options. We're going to encourage them to get safety. Uh, and we're gonna let them know that the door is always open and that we are always here for them, but they are in control of the situation. We are going to give them uh, the control over their situation to tell us what do they want to do. Mm -hmm. Michelle, let me come back to you and ask about the, the shelter as a step in the process. A domestic violence shelter is not a solution or even a need for every victim. So what are ways that victims can get support? You know, that's a, I really like the fact that if you read her book, she talks about the fact that a, a lot of people don't need shelter. And that's something that Monique has dealt with. And then also Teresa has dealt with as well. Um, also Kimberly at the OPD. Um, that, that's not a solution sometimes. People have safe shelter, but they want something else. And so that's where we're working with all the different services that we have at our domestic violence provider, but across the state. So it's gonna be um, referral to an emergency injunction or if there is the opportunity and they need to, they want to file a criminal, um, a criminal case, that's how do we help them do that. It's gonna also be making sure that there might be um, some economic empowerment work that can be done with somebody. So it might be that they need assistance getting an ID. They might need assistance as far as um, getting a bank account set up that's separate getting is even talking to the HR department to have their paycheck moved from one account into another account for economic justice. Um, another part is really coming up with that safety plan. Here in Florida, most everybody has a hurricane kit. And what we'd say is put together too. A lot of things that you have in your hurricane kit, you want and you need when you leave, such as vet records, your kids' records, your financial statements, the title to your car, the deed to your house, your insurance information. So that's something we talk to people about is that that's another resource. And so it's really uh, important about finding out what someone's situation is, listening, and then creating that plan for them to be able to leave or creating that plan for them to restart their life. And a lot of the survivors that we, what we work with, people make the, the other myth that I like to address is that people assume that if you're working with a domestic violence provider, that you are working with law enforcement. 
A lot of the people that we work with have never filed anything and they have no intention. They do not want law enforcement. They don't want DCF involved in their life. And we continue, like we are there for them. So sometimes we are the only service provider that they're talking to. And then we connect them with other nonprofits for housing, for identification, because they don't want to go to the system because of that lack of trust or it didn't work for them, or they are scared of the long-term repercussions of that. Um, so those are all the different things that when you're talking about what else can happen and what else can be there besides shelter and injunction, there's a lot of different things. And I'm, I would have to say with everything that state attorney said and also Teresa said, because we have a phenomenal community and we have been working together for years. There was the Orange County Commission that really got it started with getting um, separate courtrooms. And then that really catapulted, what can we do to make sure that things here in Central Florida are survivor focused? And the fact that so much of that happened 15 years ago, 10 years ago, has really laid a bunch of really amazing relationships and camaraderie to help survivors. And so um, working in other parts of the United States and working in other parts of the state, what we have here is different and is unique. And it puts us in a position where we can do a lot more together. I just wanted to come back to the idea of, you know, some of the practical steps that that um, you may be able to help uh, a victim with or a survivor with. And, you know, I've interviewed you a, a number of times over the last couple of years, Michelle, about the work that you've been doing with Harbour House. And, you know, one thing that sticks with me is, is that you often say the most dangerous time can be when somebody is preparing to leave. So how do you, how do you sort of navigate that? I mean, even putting a kit together could be, uh, you know, it could be a red flag. It could be difficult to do that in a way that doesn't raise the suspicion of the abuser. That must be a tricky process. It is. And a lot of the individuals that we're working with, they, there's two, what I found over the years of doing the work now for, I mean, 12 years is then, um, and Teresa can add to this, is that um, one, sometimes it's a very, it's a quick decision for someone that they have to leave because they know that if they don't, their abuser is going to kill them. Like if something has escalated, something that fight or flight in their, in their head has went off and that they know that they have to flee. So we have survivors who are like that. And then we have survivors like Michelle who want to put together a plan and they start layering it all together. And when you are working with a community service, service provider, that's where we can help you with that safety plan piece as that other layer, like her plan was awesome, but have that extra layer of it. Once you start taking back control, these are things to look for. Once you start taking back control, here's where he's gonna to try to exert more control. And how can we plan for those dangerous situations so that you know that you can call 911, your parents can call 911. And one of the things we, we talk about in safety planning is talk to your friends and family about what's happening. Shame is a huge part of domestic violence. And so breaking that in having that conversation with a friend and family member is really hard, but it, it will save someone's life because then you know that that is the one person you can go to and that you're gonna say, hey girl, I, I need to leave right now and this is the day and you have someone that you know will understand all those hidden messages. And so that's another layer of safety planning. Detective, I, I see you nodding there. I'm wondering how, how does law enforcement fit into the safety planning part of this um, piece? Well, actually, I, I'm going to ask Michelle to partner with, with us when people are ready to leave, because what when I trained our domestic violence response team and our officers um, when I was doing domestic violence is I told them to plant the seed. Uh, you wear the uniform and the badge to be the knight in shining armor. I need you to be that. So, you know, when someone calls for an abuse call, it might be the one time they've called out of a lifetime of abuse. You might get one chance and pull that person aside and say, I know you may not, I may, I know you may not be ready to leave tonight. I know you may not be ready to leave next month, but here's my business card. It's got my pager or it's got, you know, the numbers that you need for the Orlando police department. When you're ready, it's more important to leave safely than it is to leave. We need you to have a go bag. We need you to have copies of school records, shot records, clothes, money, we need you to be ready to go, but don't announce that you're leaving. So it's an education component. We tell the officers what to say. And I had some very, very good officers on the domestic violence response team that would get that call. And the victim would say, I'm ready. And then they, she'd have a team of officers ready to go because she would, we train the officer to, to train her squad. 
or we train the male officers to train their squads. The domestic violence response team, we try and have one on every squad on every shift um, to educate the officers that don't understand the layers of domestic violence. Uh, believe me, she thinks about leaving every single moment of every single day. And so, but if she makes the announcement, that's when lethality escalates. And that's when, so we also have a, a 22 question test um, not, I'm sorry, I test, I shouldn't have said that, a 22 question uh, list that allows our officers to open up dialogue um, with victims of abuse. And a lot of those questions are geared toward how violent the relationship is, and we don't score it, but we uh, get a really good picture of whether or not this relationship is going to end in uh, extreme violence or death. Um, and the two most important ones on the list, and we tell the officers this, is strangulation and stalking. Those are precursors to homicide. And if they're both present, then the lethality just skyrocketed. So we asked the officers to plant the seed about getting out safely, having a plan. And we can coordinate with Harbor House. A lot of the people she is helping at Harbor House don't have a law enforcement connection, as she stated. So when someone's planning to leave, we know that's gonna escalate. There's a possibility of escalating violence. At that point, we probably need to know, do those people live in Apopka, Winter Park, Orlando, Orange County? And maybe we can be, if we're not involved already, let's get those addresses and possibly those names. Because if there's an escalation of violence, we'd like to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. There's a cultural competency element too, I'm, I'm sure that must come into it as well. I mean, you're, you're talking about some of the specifics of domestic violence, and, and obviously you have to treat these cases with sensitivity. Um, I wanted to ask too about the approach you have to take to make sure that your officers are, are trained and, and, and know about cultures other than their own, explore their biases and are, are willing to see survivors regardless of the community or the, or the area they come from. So how do you, how do you make sure that, that that happens as well? Continuing education on, on cultures that perhaps um, where officers are not uh, aware of, um, different religions, different cultures, um, some cultures that don't view domestic violence as we do in the United States, uh, which causes, you know, perhaps um, those women not to want to reach out for assistance. So um, unfortunately, we just, we just worked um, in November, um, a family from South America, and we had never been called to their home. And when we were, um, it was a husband and wife and their 16-year-old daughter, and he had killed his wife and his daughter and himself. Um, and she was from Spain, and I believe he was from South America. So they had been married for years. So officers have to take into account that not everyone understands um, our laws, and not everyone understands how we feel about abuse. And you, you have, there's a learning component, not only for the officers, but we have to take, we have to meet people where they are and then understand how can we break down those barriers, those cultural barriers and let a victim of abuse know that this, this isn't appropriate for her and maybe her children um, to live this way, even though maybe she's thought that way her entire life in her um, young life and in her married life. Um, she might not believe that, that anything is, is wrong. And, and, we don't believe in that case that her daughter thought anything was wrong. State Attorney Worrell, um, knowing that victims go through a process uh, of, of realizing the partner is abusive, making a decision to leave, creating and executing a plan, the process can be long and complex and, and non-linear. So how does the uh, State Attorney's Office best support a victim at any given moment in that process? I feel like Michelle, Teresa, and I are kind of echoing each other um, all night, but it's exactly what Teresa just said. It's always meeting a victim where they are. That's, you know, the key to this, not pushing them to do more than they can handle at any moment, being non-judgmental and just simply giving them support, you know, starting to change the narrative again, like Michelle said, from why isn't the victim leaving to why does the perpetrator feel entitled to treat the victim with violence? It's also important for prosecutors and advocates to keep victims informed throughout the process and to let them have the opportunity to have their voice heard whenever possible, as often as they've been forced to remain silent 
for far too long. So when they're ready to speak, it's important for us to listen. Um, you know, there's a distinct gap in services that, that is ongoing funding for victims. And that's one of the things that I know that our office advocates for and will continue to advocate for so that that can be available, like Teresa said, so that when they're ready to go, they can actually go. Is that a difference between domestic violence uh, crimes or domestic violence cases and other cases? And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what makes domestic violence crimes different from, from other crimes that your office prosecutes. You know, it's funny because we had a, a, a conversation with our DV lawyers and our sex crimes lawyers. We're having to make some stru structural changes in our office um, based on what I think everybody is facing with, and that is a uh, lack of employment resources, right? We've had uh, lots of individuals leave the prosecutor's office to go into private practice because of resources. You know, here in Orlando over the last year, uh, housing has increased by 21%. So a lot of our prosecutors who wanted to be here can no longer afford to be here. Um, but one of the things that we were discussing is separating those intimate partner violence crimes from those other crimes in that in the intimate partner violence and domestic violence crimes, you have power and control. And that is the key factor that separates them from a lot of the other cases that we're dealing with um, you know, in our office. It's that, that relationship, whether it be a romantic relationship or if they're you know, married, that familial relationship, and it's the power and the control. And from um, the prosecutor's office, that's what differentiates those crimes from the other crimes. And that's the difference that can make a case escalate so quickly and become so dangerous. Um, you know, as Teresa said, the first time they got the call, everyone was dead. That's horrible. And, and it can happen just like that. And you don't know, there isn't a sign that shows you which case that's going to happen in and which case where we can get someone help and they can you know, learn different techniques on how to cope and they actually can live as a family. We just don't know. And, and you know, those are the things that make it so different. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what about a case where the survivor may fear that law enforcement or even a prosecutor may not believe them or, or become frustrated with them? So how would you go about handling a situation like that? So we do get that often. And so that's where we really utilize our, our case managers and our victim advocates to talk to survivors and get them to understand that we are there to listen, but we're also there to advocate on their behalf. And so we can set up meetings with the state attorney's office and we have advocates that will work with um, the survivors and, and just sit there and be a moral support. So they're not by themselves in the system that they don't understand. Um, same thing for law enforcement. And so when Teresa was talking about um, making sure that people can leave safely, part of that is it might be the first step of, you know, we can call law enforcement and we can get an escort in order to get your things. And you don't have to talk to them. But the fact that law enforcement's in a relationship with Harbor House, that they're willing to do that starts to win back that relational trust that might have been lost because law enforcement responded and nothing happened and the abuser wasn't taken away and they were supposed to do that and it didn't, and so I don't trust you. And so um, same thing with state attorney's office, like filing an injunction and they filed for an emergency injunction. It wasn't granted by the judge. And because of that, that means that the whole entire judicial system isn't working for me. And so it's really sitting down and talking to the survivor and explaining this, the what we have and also explaining to them what may or may not be, have gone right or wrong. It might be that you filed um, when you went there it was the wrong uh, type of injunction that you filed. There's five of them. And if you've never done this before, then it's very difficult to know what you are supposed to be doing. And so that's part of it is that we are the experts in the system to really help survivors and walk them through it together so that we can help them build trust with a lot of the different systems. And we've had some success with it. I mean, and survivors will say that sometimes as well. They're like, I'll try it again. And other ones are just like, I'm not doing it. Like, I'm just not doing it. 
all I want from you is for you to help me get the injunction and then give me a referral to a family lawyer because I want to get a divorce. And that's the reality of it as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, Detective Sprague, there have been some pretty high profile domestic violence cases um, in the national and international media, in fact, in the last year or so. Uh, just one in particular, and, and the people are, would be familiar with the, the Gabby Petito case and, and that video that came to light after the fact. What are some of the consequences of an improper police response to a call uh, as in that situation? Uh, I was actually asked by a law enforcement group to review many of the videos, body camera videos. Um, I think it was YouTube videos um, back when that happened, when Gabby unfortunately was, was killed by Brian. Um, and I was mortified, honestly. Um, the amount of time that they were out with the two of them, an investigation could have ensued. An investigation could have ensued at the facility where they were, where the initial call was made to law enforcement to even pull their vehicle over for the fighting occurring at the strip mall. Um, an investigation should have ensued there uh, to get witnesses, video, et cetera. And an investigation the, the 22 questions I mentioned earlier to, to what we call gauge lethality, um, where we're trying to determine the likelihood of a victim being seriously injured by someone who claims to love them. Um, and all the time they were out with her asking those 22 questions and opening up dialogue for a past history would have told them whether or not Brian was that guy. And so when I teach at colleges on domestic violence, I'm talking, I'm training officers and detectives, not every man abuses, not every man or woman in a relationship will be like this. And women are like this too. You're looking for certain characteristics of a person uh, that is predictable, just like Rachel Snyder has indicated, it's predictable behavior. And the only thing that changes is the name. And that's why all of us, in the domestic violence world who've been doing this work for years, watched those videos and thought, you're addressing her situation and comparing it to your wife at home. And the other officer was comparing it to his ex-wife. And you're not taking the time, you're trying to have a connection or make a, a correlation, but you're not taking the time to get to know him and get to know her and find out about their relationship. The officers' relationships with their current spouses or previous spouses, saying it was the same or it was similar, was a complete waste of time because they didn't know who they were dealing with. You have to ask the right questions and have enough information to figure out what's been happening in their relationship. And one of the key things I keyed in on is she was starting like a YouTube channel and he kept telling her how stupid it was. I open up that conversation peel back the onion in those layers, find out how much verbal abuse she's been suffering, and then go from there. Did, has that verbal abuse ever turned physical? Um, has he ever put his hands around your, around your throat? Has he ever pushed you, harmed you, you know, um, uh, not let you ride in a vehicle, kicked you out of your own living quarters in the, in the vehicle? There's a number of things I wish they would have asked and then when you finally realize that she's in a dangerous situation, you have to call her family. I know she's in her 20s. To me, she was still a kid, but you have to call her family and express your concerns. If the police don't tell you as an individual that you have, you're with someone that could kill you. And if you don't, if you're not telling their loved ones, I think this relationship is dangerous and there's a high likelihood that this could end badly, who's gonna tell them? Someone has to be honest with people. And I had no issues. And a lot of people, a lot of officers do. If I felt someone was in danger, I told them. And they minimized and they didn't believe me until it got to a point where they had to believe me because they were in a, a, just a very, very dangerous situation that we ended up saving them from, um, which was would have been serious injury or, de or death without question. So victims minimize. Officers, you can't do that. You can't minimize just because the victim is. We're the experts. Um, some, I think it was Rachel mentioned earlier in her scenario about the uh, family ask, uh, the officers asking the family, well, what do you want us to charge? Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, before we retrained our officers through the grant, we were arresting victims who were being assaulted. Um, you know, now, instead of asking about 
um, who the primary aggressor is, which are who the uh, who hit who first. Um, who's the who's the who's the person experiencing fear? Uh, when you pushed him away, what was happening? What was happening when you pushed him off of you? Well, he was backing me into a corner and had his fists up like this. That's assault. We were arresting the person who hit first or who pushed first and not asking the right questions. And we had to change. We were arresting our victims. This is a, a really great and robust conversation. We are running a little short on time though. So I just wanted to ask one final question uh, of Michelle in the, the last minute or so here. And that is, is there anything being done locally to proactively help men? Um, Rachel Lee Snyder talked in a book about how perpetrators often come from homes of trauma and abuse themselves. So is there anyone in central Florida addressing this and what kind of services for men suffering from mental health crises themselves and feeling that they need to use violence and control are out there? I'm first gonna remove men from that conversation because perpetrators can be female as well. And so that's something that's really important. And so when we're talking about batterers, um, it's male or female. And so along with that, um, DCF just got re-engaged with what we call the batterers intervention program. And so that is a program that would be court mandated when people get into sentencing, if they've been accused of domestic violence and then they get to the sentencing piece that they would be attending. And so that is a, a, a program that people can go into. And so they learn more about the power and control. And for some of them, they have that discovery of what it was tied to as far as mental health and how it might've been tied to their childhood. Um, but it's a double edge. I mean, some people do come out of there learning more as far as to own their abuse and to not be an abuser. But on the other side of it, um, and I think that the state attorneys and, and Teresa, that you can add your opinion to it, but mine is some of them do come out of it um, more savvy abusers. And so that's the other piece of it is that we are, have pieces in place, but at the same point in time, it all depends on the person who's going into it. And that's the other piece is that people who abuse and who um, are who have power and control over another person, um, it's going to be up to them to take that step in order for them to want to get help. It, it be it that be mental health or be it that it's substance abuse or whatever it might be. Um, that is something that as far as Harbor House is concerned, we don't work with abusers. We work with survivors. And at the same point in time, we know that survivors have to make their choice of the fact that they want to leave, that they want to receive services, that they want to press charges. It's the same thing on the other side with the abusers. Abusers choose to abuse. I want to say that again. Abusers choose to abuse. And there's things that will escalate it, but it's also up to them if they want to stop abusing, they have to seek that help. And they can do that through different services that are available, but that's the biggest thing I wanted to say. Uh, look, um, this has been a, a fantastic discussion. Michelle, Monique, and Teresa, thank you so much for your insights um, and your, your words tonight. And I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel now. Matthew, thank you so much for facilitating this conversation. And I really want to thank Michelle Frizzell, Monique Worrell, and Teresa Spray for just really coming together. What, I, what I'm sensing is the cooperation, the collaboration, and the leadership. And I just want to commend each of you because I think it's felt among us who are listening that this is happening in our community. And that's really what Rachel said to us coming together, collaborating in the community and getting through the bureaucracy. So I think this is amazing what you all are doing. And just with PJI and our CRC are creating a resilient community network and the many partners who are here tonight making this part possible. There were many, many community partners at the table. And we have an event that we will come together in May. We had hoped and intended to come together um, today, uh, but with Omicron, we decided let's wait. Let's wait till we can come together more safely as a community and continue this conversation because it will be a cross-sector collaboration where we address this together, learn more about it, and envision the future we want together in Central Florida that will help continue to make a difference. So I'm just very grateful for the leadership here tonight. Um, I also wanna thank JP Morgan Chase again for being here, Patty and her team and for the support. And oh yeah, thank you, Keith, for showing all these incredible partners. I mean, really, 
So many people are ready to have this conversation in Central Florida. And I think, you know, one of the things that was brought up just here when we talked was getting past the shame, getting past the shame. So many people in the chat, so many of us here tonight relate to this issue, have experienced it, and we need to, um, to get through the secrecy and the silence. So I want to announce our book winners. We have five of them. Uh, and thank you to Trisha, who is uh, back there helping us with this. Cynthia Moore won a book tonight. Laura Valencia won a book. Sydney Anas, Lisa Alexander, and Leslie Chaco want a book tonight. So thank you for being here. And thank you to the over 120 people that were here tonight participating. That's a lot of people showing up on a Wednesday night to talk about domestic violence. And I, I really don't want to minimize this. Change happens when each one of us stands up and, and, and says, I'm going to make a difference by learning what Teresa was teaching us about interacting with the police, understanding the services that Michelle is offering us, and learning more about the judiciary and how uh, the state attorney's office participates and supporting them, supporting one another. Thank you, Matthew Petty, for always bringing important stories to us. Thank you to my team, PJI, to Brittany Pierce, who has fiercely led this week. We have one more day of conversation on justice, which happens all day tomorrow. Uh, some more great workshops. And again, thank you to Keith Hill, who's been helping us with our um, technology backstage. And have a good evening, everyone. Rest well and reach out to the Harbor House, the Victim Service Center, and any of those resources that were provided tonight so that we can all have a safe, secure home. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Beautiful cat. Good night, kitty. Have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Bye, everybody.